and welcome to Early Childhood Ireland's podcast, which features interviews and discussions on all issues relating to high quality in the early years and school age care sector. In our episodes, we have a range of speakers who are leaders in the areas that matter to Early Childhood Ireland members. This podcast series is proudly supported by Aricus Insurance, which offers a comprehensive range of cover at discounted premiums for both business and personal insurance products. So visit www.aricus.ie for more information. Every year, Early Childhood Ireland has commissioned Red Sea to conduct an opinion poll to gauge public attitudes to early years care and education. This is the sixth year that we've done this, so interesting trends are evident uh, at this stage. So to explore the findings of this year's barometer and to look at some of those trends, I'm delighted to be joined by my colleague Francis Byrne. Frances is the Director of Policy Advocacy and Campaigning in Early Childhood Ireland, and she has a huge interest in advocating for children in early years and school age care in member settings in Ireland in relation to government policy. So, Frances, uh, you're most welcome, and thank you for joining me today. Thank you, Maura. So, can you start by giving us some um, background to the, uh, the barometer um, how it's conducted, why we do it and so on. Sure. So um, in 2018, we first approached Red Sea Market Research, who are a, a very renowned polling company. And um, they carry out polls. If you, if, if you see a political poll um, in the Business Post, for example, it'll be theirs. Um, and they have lots of clients, not, not, not just in the political sphere. So we approached them and they began to ask um a series of questions for for us and some of those questions are now part of a tracking poll that we have asked for six years and in one case for five years just because a commitment was made that we put into the 2019 poll so over the six years it has really given us a very comprehensive uh, picture of the general attitude of the Irish public towards a range of issues pertaining to early years and school age care in Ireland um, and Red Sea um, has you know a particular way of sampling to make sure that the 1000 or so people who um, are who respond every year uh, represent um, the diversity of age, social class, gender, um, whether they have children or not, if their parents are not um, and their work status. Um, so we're we're quite confident in the findings, and uh, the findings are sort of accepted um, as being uh, worthwhile um, and certainly robust um, from a polling point of view. I think there's a geographic spread as well. Did you mention geography? Am I right? There is a regional spread. So we have a regional spread as well. too. Yeah, um, yeah. So regional, um, regional can be very interesting, actually. Um, so we, and I should have also said the obvious one, which is the entire population <laughs> and then the results according to uh, various demographics. And some years the demographics are very much in, in line with the overall. And sometimes we see disparities in regions or sometimes you certainly see disparities um, between parents. You know, the, the, you'll see a lot of support um, for more public funding, for example. And this year. Um, I think our attention has been drawn to um, quite substantial gender gaps, uh, which is very interesting um, in, in terms of some of our findings. So, um, so yes, absolutely, um, regional and, and everything else. Yeah. So that's what I mean by it's very comprehensive. So it, it, it's a good broad demographic that's representative of the entire population. So what were the key findings this year, uh, the key kind of headline stats and discoveries? Sure. So I suppose for us, um, Early Childhood Ireland is of the view that every child should be guaranteed access to high quality and inclusive early years and school age care in their community. 79% um, of all adults agree with us, which is very heartening. Um, and again, there's, there's a a very uh, even spread, except when it comes to gender, where it falls by four points to um, 75 percent for men and goes up by four percent um, to 83 percent among women, which is probably telling us something about um, the way care um, operates, responsibility that perhaps mothers take. Um, 
and but I mean across the board in terms of age as well um, there's certainly a recognition. The highest results we got for that one this year was among farmers <laughs> at 84 percent um, which is really interesting um, and something that we're always struck by and um, so in the social class breakdown one of the groups that's given um, um, is, is farmers and, and it's very high and we often see that um, in, in our polling that we get a lot of support particularly when we focus on quality and access um, from the farming community in Ireland. I'm not sure what that says, but it's very it's welcome to support. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Coming from a farming um, background myself, you know, it, it, it could well be that, you know, farmers need maybe flexible care if maybe, you know, maybe a, a, one parent is at home part-time, working part-time, sometimes might be um, uh, doing farming duties and would need uh, uh, flexible care, because I think maybe that's something that um, lots of people would like to see more of, but can't be, um, is very difficult to provide with with current models. But uh, yeah, it's an interesting one. It is interesting and and, and absolutely uh, don't disagree with you at all. I've, al I've also often wondered that flexibility that you're that you're mentioning, Maura, is that also tied in with the fact that lots and lots of farmers are also doing other things? So they really need the flexibility. So they're outside the home, because I think certainly for a, a pure non-farming person like myself, I might make assumptions about, well, farmers are on the land, therefore there's somebody at home, therefore they, they don't need quote unquote childcare. But is there something about the combination but is there also something about like one of the things that I would love to have funding to investigate is, and I'm not sure how you would do it retrospectively because we didn't start polling till 2018, but I would love to go back in time and look at the impact of ECHI on an older age group. So, you know, aunts, uncles and grandparents being observing changes within their within their grandchildren possibly by generation because certainly teachers would say this is very anecdotal now just to be clear mm. that they would certainly notice when actually started and not every child not every three-year-old was attending they would they could they would they felt they were quite confident about the first day of junior infants you know who's been in preschool um, so I wonder, I've often wondered because again uh, um, alongside farmers we often find huge levels of support among retired people um, and their, their demographic, which is obviously um, the, the older demographic. So I, I often wonder about that. Now, I should immediately say that when we break down and look at adults with children or not, we have 79% support among people who don't have children. So there is something, but I wonder, is it the, there's something going on, but I wonder, is it the impact of ECHI that has now become part of our all of our lives? And is there something about people recognising the importance of that to children? So I think it's interesting, but that's not to, I agree about the flexibility as well. There's yeah. a lot going on here, yeah. And yeah. the old, the older um, cohort, that could well be grandparents who Absolutely. are perhaps feeling, you know, that they're delighted to see more of their grandchildren, but maybe are feeling over, overburdened. And if there were more access they could maybe enjoy grandchildren more rather than feeling very tied down or stressed or whatever. Yeah, or, 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 or indeed are feeling that stress and worry from their from their own adult sons and daughters, because, you know, whenever we whenever um, we do um, particularly local media and we did a lot of local and regional media uh, about the barometer this year. And you know how some shows um, are very open to people texting in and most are these days. And I'm always struck by the numbers of older people who get in touch and talk about that, whether we're on about the barometer or any other reason that we might be on, that older people are really concerned about the impact of the cost and the lack of availability in some areas, be they rural or very densely populated areas where there can be lists, you know, the lists for um uh, for, for 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 care and education, but also worried about their their grandchildren missing out, which I think is another aspect of it. Because I do think there's something that preschool now has become embedded in Irish society, and you and I know, and most of our listeners will know, that's not enough. We need much more than that. But it's a very welcome start, considering Etchy's only been with us 
for just over a decade and obviously has had a huge impact in, in, in the lives of Irish families and, and, and their extended families as well. Yeah, yeah. And, and that point about grandparents, I suppose, that ties in with flexibility as well, that that flexibility to be able to, you know, have access to maybe centre-based care when you need it, but equally, you know, if granny and granddad are visiting from exactly. uh, down the country that, um, you know, they can spend quality time together as, Absolutely. as, as well, you know. And we it's, saw it's, that, we saw that in the last year or so when, when the world really did start opening up again. And we absolutely saw that people were, um, you know, mobile again and therefore you know coming down and spending time to catch up with family and have normal time as opposed to you know that sort of behind masks time so mm. I'm sure all I'm sure all of this is in the past absolutely yeah. probably yeah so I suppose we've kind of led into the next thing that I was going to tease out with you Francis is you know how the public feels about investment and uh from what you're saying it's clear that there is support for uh, increased investment you, you, a good start has been made but certainly there's scope for that to go a whole lot further absolutely um and, and i think what i think that that comes out really strongly in the the five questions that we've asked over a number of years one of which i said is only only five years um but the others are six so you know we were a little bit concerned um particularly i think during 2021 which i know we all seem to have forgotten but in some ways, it was a more uncertain time than 2020, because I think there was something about 2020. This is not scientific now. This is very much an opinion um, that we I think we all psychologically and physically battened down the hatches. Whereas 2021, we weren't entirely sure, you know, we the vaccines were here. There, there, there were many lockdowns and, you know, all of that. And so our, you know, for the for the first time with those tracking numbers, the, the numbers went down. So they, they'd either held steady or increased over 2018, 2019, 2020. And now what we have seen is that they have gone um that you know that they've gone back up um to the levels that they would have been when, when we started, or in some cases um increased. The one exception being, which I think is really heartening, um, and we certainly are very buoyed by it. The the one um the one thing that hasn't gone, the one area that hasn't gone down is uh, recognition and support for staff in settings, which is really, really interesting. So we have, this is the one that we've asked for five years because a commitment was given um, in 2018 after, after our poll had closed that um, um, under EU guidelines, earlier staff who work directly with children must be as qualified as other professionals, such as nurses and teachers. And our question uh, for the last five years has been when this occurs or our statement the terms and conditions of their employment should reflect this so it started out at 69 percent of support and again when we look at the demographics across the board very strong support which is you know almost seven out of ten adults and it has done nothing but increase over the over those years so it's now at 74 percent so during the wobbly year <laughs> of 2021, what actually happened, wobbly for everything else, it went from 67% in 2020 to 73% in 2021. Right. So if you remember during COVID, we absolutely heard on the airwaves, but also we heard from parents how much they appreciated the measures that um, Early Childhood Ireland's members were taking, that staff were taking, the commitment, the flexibility, all of the good things. So clearly that, that, that so it's really interesting because we've gone from we've actually climbed to almost three quarters of the population and um, whereas others, as I said, didn't hold uh, um, uh, uh, as steady. But we're very glad to see them on, on the increase now. And um, so it, so it is interesting that um, we see, you know, one of the things that we've wanted to interrogate is um the 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 valuing of of um education for children under five and we see that creeping back up again even though it fell quite dramatically um which is just you'd, again you'd love the funding to interrogate that because on the one hand staff were valued on the other hand overall it, it was seen as um that that the educations of over fives were more important now maybe that's because um, member settings were open more and it was almost exactly. taken for granted. I would love to interrogate that more mm. if we can't. Um, yeah. And then we have the questions around income and payment and all of that. And again, we have seen that 
massively increase in relation to that it should be free, like it should be provided um, early years and, and school age should be provided on the same basis as, as, as um, primary education. Um, and then one that I'm very pleased and, I, and the policy team is very pleased to see start to recover again, which is this one that, you know, all parents should be financially supported to stay at home with their child for the first 12 months of the child's life. And that started out at 70 percent in 2018 and really went down. I mean, it went down to 58 percent in 2021. I had kind of a sleepless night, um, but mm. it's going back up now at 65 percent. Um, and we actually did pause um, in 2021 and spoke to Red Sea. And it was really interesting. And they were very kind enough to share insights with us from their other polling. And they said, look, there's so much uncertainty. People are really, it wasn't so much uncertainty about COVID. It was uncertainty about the future and the economy. And so they said to us, and again, they didn't tell us which clients, but they were very generously said, look, um, we're seeing this across the board. People are holding fear about anything that might look like it costs money. And of course, this is something that would cost money and so it should. Um, and I suppose linked to, to that issue and that very important period of children's lives, we we every year we ask these tracking questions and then we ask some new ones, um, depending on what's in the ether. So this year, really, this isn't in the ether, but we kind of want it to be. <laughs> Early Childhood Ireland is very keen to have this discussion in Ireland, which is about that first year and how will it be paid for? And certainly our colleagues in Work Equal and certainly fathers who write about, who are journalists, who, um, you know, communicate for a living. And certainly the evidence from what we know about the civil service shows us that even with paid paternity leave, dads are quite unwilling to take it up or are not taking it up. And when people dig down into that a bit, the reason that's given is financial, which is completely understandable. So one of the, I mean, it may sound like a very provocative statement, but we want to open up this debate in Ireland. So the new question this year, the new statement was, if all employers should be legally obliged to top up wages when the parents of new babies are on maternity or paternity leave. So what new parents will say is, well, yes, I mean, I was very grateful in, in the case of mothers to have the six months or whatever, but unfortunately, I got no top up, so I had to go back to work immediately. And that's certainly why, why dads would say, and look, we any of us who are parents um, have had, you know, young children will know it's the most expensive year of your life. There's no getting around it. Um, and so you can understand. And of course, in, in a world where children are valued, and in a world where, you know, children are at the heart of public policy, if we are saying, and I, every piece of evidence shows this, that with very, very narrow exceptions where families are in, you know, very challenging circumstances, it is absolutely in the best interest of children to spend that first year with one or both parents in a two parent situation where they're sharing. And so what we want, to, we want to ask this question to see, well, how will it be paid for? So 58% of all adults agree. For the benefit of our listeners, I don't mind saying to the early childhood audience, audience I was actually quite surprised by that. I thought it would be lower. Um, I would have thought so too. Um, yeah, yeah. Now we do see that... a disparity again when it comes to men and women, which is telling mm. us something. It drops down by 5% for men to 53 and up by 5 women by 63 it's just so interesting mm. and it shoots up to parents of under twos um at 72 percent so we 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 were we weren't being i suppose we weren't being deliberately provocative but it's a very straight up sentence um and and we would we would really like to in, initiate a debate about this there are certainly employers who will never be able to do it they're small you know they're on very tight margins but there are certainly employers who could do who aren't doing it mm. So there is something about the state employers and everybody coming together. How are we going to finance this? Is there a special tax? Is there something that could be put into a pot that mm. every parent can feel the, fin the economic confidence? Because none of us wants to be making, you know, you really don't want parents in a scenario where they're making economic decisions about what's best in the best interest of their children. That's horrendous for them. Yeah. Um, and it's not good for their children. So, yeah, so we were quite buoyed by that and, and we made the decision and we had kind of made the decision before we saw the result, but buoyed by the result, we're, we're, we're going to make this one of our tracking, one now, tracking ones now just to see. 
Um, okay. So look, we might we might it might dip down to forty three percent next year, but and we're going to do. I mean, we, we, we talk about it all the time in early childhood Ireland, but I, I you know, we, we plan on doing a bit more about that, um, uh, and and to talk to other organisations who we think look, this is something really important to campaign on to build, you know, to coalesce around and build a consensus about, um, and and um. Yeah, it's interesting, and you know, some I've been in touch with some members about that, and they're they, they really interesting things to say about it as well, and completely agree that there are definitely families for whom part time centre based care in the first year or a flexibility around it mm. would be absolutely amazing, but of course they're not in a position to offer that. So there's also that side of the coin to be debated yeah. and agreed upon as well. Yeah. Yeah. And it can be difficult for self-employed parents, even leave, you know, even if you leave finance out of it, which is very difficult to do. But if you run your own business, if you run your own company, um, it it can be. I was self-employed when I had my eldest and uh, was kind of, you know, straight back to work with hindsight. I could have taken a bit longer, but at the time it felt really important that um, my parents didn't think, as in the parents of the children, didn't think that I was um, not going to be not going to be there to provide the service. So, yeah. you know, there are a lot of um, a lot of variables in that. But that kind of support, um, you know, when we when we saw the results of it, I was very pleasantly surprised at that level of, of support for yeah. it, which is um like you say, it's it's really heartening, and it's 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 good to see that by and large we're such um, a family friendly country. Yeah, I think so. I think so, and I, and I think, as I said, there have been I call them role models, you know, and and maybe it's because I notice men in communi- the communications industry more because of my job, but I have really noticed it, um, you know, and 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 so and some of them saying it some of them you know saying it in public quite ruefully you know um i i'm I, i'm enjoying doing it but i'm having to do it because of you know the crazy way life is organized here um but absolutely about the self employed i mean w- it, for, from early childhood ireland's perspective we want everybody to be part of that conversation but it's the conversation that needs to happen because we've never had it and so just like everything we have seen evolve about the education and care of young children um, in their years before they start school, if I could put it that way, it has sort of evolved from um, other things. So, you know, there was a need to do something, do something in inverted commas about disadvantaged children. The state at one point was able to see actually early years care and education makes a huge difference to those, those children. Then the thinking moved on and people realized actually it makes a big difference to all children. It just makes an additional difference. And all of that, we've seen the impact of, of AIM, um, you know, all, the, all these positive things, but we haven't really talked about, we haven't planned for what would be like that first year to look like and how are we going to pay for that, you know? And of course, the diversity of family circumstances, including working from home, including um, running your own business, night shifts, all of that needs to be brought into the equation. Absolutely. Yeah. And supports for what is generally women in that first year at home as well, that, Absolutely. you know, that you need, you know, supportive services, you need the parent and toddler groups that, you know, that we have a number of of, of members. So, yes. you know, sometimes that first year can be isolating um, and having other having other supports and services available to, you know, ensure that um, that the parents and the baby are supported and nurtured in that absolutely, vital time absolutely. in the child's life, isn't it? 100%. So, th- so I suppose I should make it that clear. I mean, our question was about topping up wages and looking at the economic side, because we know that that's informing decision making and people are feeling under pressure and that's not good for children. But absolutely, the, there's a public services part of this as well, and that needs to be paid for. So, you know, you, you'll hear people talk about, oh, oh, if only for the public health nurse, I wouldn't have, you know, survived. Mm. If I wouldn't have gotten through a period of postnatal depression or I was really worried about the baby's weight and being able to go over every week and all of that. But then you'll also hear from mothers who say, I didn't see a public health nurse. I don't know what you're mm. talking about, you know. So that's yeah. not good. 
Um, yeah. So absolutely, you're absolutely right to remind us of that, Maura. It is, we we were asking this about, because we know this is a pressure point in terms of the, co- the cost of the first year, but it's all about the first year and what yeah. kind of public services do, do, do we want in place? And we know that um, it's all for the good. The more that we invest, the more that we do, the more contact there is, the more wraparound there is for those families, the better off everybody is. Mm. Um, which again is a big economic argument it isn't the one we will be making yeah because we'll be doing it for other reasons but as it happens there's an economic dividend to do it to doing all of that absolutely so Francis, I, I was was thinking of of asking you about the the trends um that we we could see over the tracking questions and i think you've um covered a share of that already is there anything more that you'd like to add to that I think we I think it's interesting that, um, you know, listeners will remember that there was, you know, a budget or two where we we felt like we barely got a look in. I think particularly the 2021 budget and we were so shocked because there wasn't it wasn't possible to pick up a newspaper or tune into the radio for a few hours without hearing something about our sector. Um, So certainly there there's there's a, a, a. a political message has been received loud and clear, I think. Um, and I suppose what's interesting to reflect on at this point and to look at the tracking is that it has very much focused on the staff, which I think we would always want to be asking about. They're you know absolutely critical to delivering quality for children. Um, they're dedicated professionals. Uh, some of them so like so qualified and yet as we all know the terms and conditions still haven't caught up so I think that would remain I think the I think I don't we're 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 giving it we're reflecting a lot on the tracking poll so your question is coming at a very good time because you know we're also thinking okay the political signals are good we're going to you know dip over a billion euro in expenditure for the first time this year I didn't think that we would see it so so soon um, so early childhood Ireland has things to say about how that money should be spent. We're assuming that that year on year, you can't really spend a billion point two five point zero two five and then not spend it the following year. Mm. So we're assuming it, and not only that, it's absolutely assuming it's going to increase. And I think that the Minister for Children has given some commitments around that, you know, has talked about obviously core funding and so on have to increase and potential changes to the national childcare scheme and all of that. So one of the things I think it would be really interesting is to delve down a bit more into what does quality look like. We certainly will have things to say about that. Of course. And to ask the Irish public about that. So I think we'll have very interesting conversations um, with Red Sea later this year about trying to maybe at the level of digging digging a bit into what the Irish public thinks quality looks like. Um, I, I also would like, you know, I, I'd love to know more about um, that access piece because it's very, very mixed. And certainly the sector profile that Bubble does every year, which is, you know, as I call it, the Bible. And, you know, it's, it's fantastic. Um, it's, a, it's a moment in time. And then what, you, what we'll often hear from members is, God, you know, three settings have changed their, changed their services or one has gone into a school and all of that data that somehow gets missed um, and and so the access picture changes and then of course we do know that the next thing that the that the government is is focusing on in terms of partnership for the public good which was the document they brought out um, a year and a half ago which core funding was the first part the next part is going to be what that document calls disadvantaged which is a whole piece around children from um, low-income families children from families that there might be um, the child or a member of the family might have a disability. Um, so it's disadvantage in a very broad, uh, a very broad definition. And so there's definitely um, work to be done about that and questions to be asked about that. So the tracking may change where we're, we're giving a lot of thought to um, how we, how we might grow and adapt the barometer in light of the fact that fingers very tightly crossed Ireland is finally moving towards um, the, 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 the higher levels of expenditure. We have a long way to go. But mm. You can't also be churlish. Like, you know, the, the government committed to doubling funding in 2018 terms when we when we started our first barometer, which is around 40, 448 million. They committed to doubling that. 
by 2028 and they're going to achieve that by the end of 2023. That's quite incredible. It is. Uh, and I think it's important for an organization like ours to take take a, a step up and start, you know, describing what we think quality looks like and, and, and quality, what quality means to children, but also to hear from the Irish public. And it will, and it, um, in relation to our new strategic plan, um, it, it, it fits right in because, you know, we, the other, the other part of that triangle is, you know, member settings are delivering excellence. So we want them to tell us, we want to do research with members that's already started um, in, in delivering projects. We want to interrogate that, you know, we've been doing a lot of door, work on outdoors, as you know. Yeah. Um, and in relation to other projects. So that's certainly very high on the policy team's agenda for this year. So all of that thinking, I'm thinking out loud now on the podcast. Yeah. yeah. It's almost <laughs> like a counselling session more. No, I'm joking. Um, no, but it is very useful. And, and I think what you've kind of spotted in the in the um, barometer and maybe the comms around it is that we sort of feel we've reached a juncture now and mm. we might revamp but there are certainly tracking questions that we will continue to ask yeah because they're, yeah. they're fascinating they're telling us really important things and yeah. you know just to say the barometer is launched and we do a lot of media and we're very grateful for it particularly love doing the local get asked brilliant questions but we use this throughout the year so sometimes we hear things or you'll see a budget kite being flown and it's really great for us to share across our social media channels sometimes we go as far as issuing a press release if we're very concerned about something or we're delighted to see something to really reiterate so through the whole rest of the year um we get enormous value from the barometer and we are able to say look that's not a good idea and actually here's why it's not a good idea for children um but also the irish public agrees with us because nothing mm. will make a politician sit up <laughs> Like, you know, you saying, well, the Irish public now is fully behind more investment, better access, better quality. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I think it, it, it's interesting to see that we, you know, that the public are very much on that journey that I suppose we in early childhood Ireland would see all this as a children's rights issue. Um, exactly. and, and less so labour activation, women in the workforce and that the the, the public are behind us in that yeah and it is interesting and and and, and attached to that of course is the the issue of fees you know mm. and, and so the barometer is very useful to us when when you know a report will come out or somebody will make a pronouncement about something or maybe a bunch of parents all get in touch with their local radio or, or national radio station talking about the cost of childcare, and we'll often be asked to comment and you know annoyingly for some people <laughs> we always start with Apologies now, please don't let, let us spike your blood pressure. But early years and school age care and education is supposed to be expensive. So let's mm. just say that now. It shouldn't be on the back of low pay. Yeah. It should be 100% laser focused on the delivery of quality experiences for every child, regardless of their circumstances, their parents' circumstances, who comes in the door of, a, of any of our member settings. So can we have the discussion, please, about who's going to pay for it? Because it That's absolutely it. shouldn't be on no more than quality. Should, should Delivering quality should be on the backs of low paid, uh, mostly women, as we know, 98 percent uh, uh, of women and two percent of of, of, the, uh, of men, um, none of whom should be uh, underpaid, nor should it come on the back of parents having to pay the highest fees in Europe absolutely not absolutely um, so the barometer can really help us with those debates and discussions during the year you know to try and say look there's a very and you're right to highlight it the Irish public has a very nuanced understanding of what's happening here and yes they might vent and yes they might throw up their hands mm. but you'll often hear now more and more they say and by the way I know this isn't the fault of my press and the staff are brilliant but this is very frustrating for me as a parent. I'm paying a fortune for a place or I can't get a place or I had to tell the creche that I was pregnant before I told my extended family because mm. I wanted the bumps name down on the, you know, which is absolutely horrible when you, th when you hear those yeah. things. You, but no, you're absolutely right. So it, that, that's why it's so heartening to see the, the, the levels of support um, uh, stay uh, steadfast or increase. And when we do ask these new questions, to, to, to see that people get what you're asking, they understand the importance. And um, so no, it's really it's really good and 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 a great um, as I said, we're we're always very buoyed 
uh, always very buoyed by it. It's fantastic, yeah. And it's a privilege to be able to do it. It's really, uh, and it's not one that, you know, that, that we take lightly. Um, so no, it's great and, 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 and powerful ammunition. Absolutely. Francis, thanks a million for taking the time to come on the podcast today. I really enjoyed the analysis and uh, kind of delving a bit deeper into, you know, some of the trends and uh, look after our chat. I'm looking forward to next year already. So thank you very much, Francis. Anytime, Maura. And if anybody wants to get in touch about the uh, barometer or any of our work, um, policy at earlychildhoodireland.ie is the best way to get um, any of us in the policy team and we'll, we'll be back very quickly. Perfect. And uh, thank you for listening to this episode of Early Childhood Ireland's podcast, which is proudly supported by Aricus Insurance. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe and spread the word to your friends and colleagues and stay tuned for our next episode.